spoilers? Oh, lots and lots of spoilers. Hi, friends. Welcome to another edition of Max Mike Motivations. And congratulations on continuing your journey to be a better you. You have to ask yourself that most important question. In your life, who has the power? That's right, you do. We all do. You've got to reach down inside yourself, find your inner gray skull, and raise high your potential sword of power and declare to the heavens, I sure as heck have the power. Because you do. Now, for our next session, please send all of your bumpy bucks to the following Max. address. Max. Which is just with... Post- Max. What? what in a giant flaming pile of pudding are you talking about? Well, I've, we're not getting any more advertisers since Rogue Warfare 3. And, <laughs> you know, we need, we need to generate some revenue, darn it. Our, we do not we motivate. We have cash flow we, and no. productivity. And, no. and, and synergies no. and thinking outside the box. We do not motivate. We annoy. Get that through your head or I'll take the pony and put him in your place. <sighs> Keep your bumpy bugs, folks. You'll need them. <laughs> Made for TV. Love you and so forth. Uh, this, this week, we're subjecting ourselves to a movie based on a cartoon based on a toy. No, not that one. No, not, not that one either. Wow, there are a lot of those suckers. Uh, oh, no, man. it's the one with Dolph Lundgren and all his rippling pecs going oh. up against the mountain of ham that is Frank Langella. That's right, it's Strawberry Shortcake the Revenge. Oh, no, rippling no. pecs, Andy, oh, mm. <laughs> No, no, it's Masters of the Universe, because apparently even Golan Globus couldn't <laughs> get themselves to call a movie He-Man. <laughs> Based on the toy slash cartoon character who looks like someone force-fed him a moving van full of steroids, this piece of pure 1980s brings to life, sort of, (laughs) that character who went from children's toy to cartoon legend to gay icon, the lazily named (laughs) He-Man. Is is the movie a success or is it a big stinkor? Let's find out. I'm your host with a rotating head, Max E. Faces, and over there is the clamp champ who's no cringer but won't buzz off, Mike Ram Man Loose. Wow, I gotta give you credit for working all of those toys into the intro. And I didn't even get a fraction of the full line in there. And the scary part is I know you didn't have to look a single one up. I did not. I did actually run across Buzz Off. I had forgotten him. Yeah. I think he's B-based. Sure. But yes, we're, we are. But before we get to this cinematic gem, <laughs> we've got our poll question from last week. Has product has a product placement in a movie ever made you want to buy the item in question? Have you ever done so? This one was apparently a little more difficult, and I, I have an idea why, and we'll get to that. But, uh, Geneva Brunetti says, I've been ruminating on this and can't seem to recall a specific movie or thing that I've wanted because of a movie in terms of brand. Everything I've wanted has been an idea or not based in real life. I've always wanted to try Birdie Bot's Every Flavored Beans, which I've purchased knowing they're just jelly bellies. Don't try them. Ah, Europe, Europeans. <laughs> I've wanted to types of clothing and furniture, but not a specific brand. Maybe the closest thing would be an old Apple computer, the ones with the colorful monitors. Yeah. Our boy Dave said, I only decided I liked the Silver Surfer after I saw the Richard Gere movie Breathless. And I took a few ballet dance lessons after I saw the Red Shoes, but gave up quickly. Do either of those count? No. No, they don't. Next. Uh, (laughs) Silver Surfer, maybe. I I don't know about that. That's more actually sort of leading into... uh, our next week's question, but well, uh, what is? Have you seen the, the Breathless film? Or I know the I've Red seen shoes. bits and pieces of it, and then I can't remember if there was a French version or an English, American version. But there is a sequence where some Richard Gere is co- cornered by some nerd in a comic book store who goes off about the Silver Surfer. <laughs> okay, that's I'm just all trying I know. to picture Richard Gere in a film that involved the Silver Surfer in any way, shape, or form, and no. Yeah, no. It's a metaphor or something. Sure. Uh, Haley Paulson tells us, I think it's a tough question because if I have, I probably wouldn't have done so consciously. That's, I think, one of the big issues with this question. We'll get to it. 
I've never watched Joan Crawford drink a Pepsi and thought, <laughs> yeah, I'd rather have one of those than a Coke like I usually do. I would like to know what movie Joan Crawford drinks a Pepsi in. But I don't think she does. Don't really notice product placement in films because, to me, branded material on screen just washes over me in the same way branded material in daily life doesn't stand out to me either. Hmm. Uh, Matt Reisman says, Leon Paul fencing equipment. That's oddly specific <laughs> because Madonna used it in a James Bond movie. Oh, I kid. Yeah. Bond being plastered all over their website actually turned me off it for a while. Does a Graflex count? Oh, because sure. Because the only reason I want one is Star Wars. What is a Graflex? So Graflex was a maker of camera equipment, and the most famous piece of their equipment was a... Uh, oh, the Mac- Dijkstra Flex. No, no, no. no. Dijkstra oh, Flex was oops. a camera system for motion control. But oh. uh, Graflex, think of a metal tube, at the end of which is supposed to be a flash attachment. The tube is really mostly for the power, the batteries, the D-cells. But back in the old days, you know, um, extra, extra, that back then, the cameras would have these giant, they had to be powered by something, and all they had was D-cells. So there was this aluminum tube, and there was a couple of buttons and stuff on it, but it's mostly just filled with like three or four D-cells. However... When you take one of those, you take the flash part off, and you add a few other goo and a grip along the bottom, suddenly it becomes a lightsaber. Oh. And that's where the original lightsaber prop came from, was a Graflex oh, no flash gun <laughs> handle. I actually had okay. one once, so I knew what he was talking about. Right. Cool. Uh, Rebecca Pelkey said, uh, maybe cars? I remember watching The Italian Job and really wanting a Mini Cooper afterwards. <laughs> Couldn't afford one, though, of course. Sure. Well, she was a guest of ours, too, the, the wonderful yes, Dr. Rebecca Pelkey. Dr. Rebecca Pelkey. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, Chuck Mock says, many of the more interesting products I see aren't exactly purchasable. The Bond BMW, a multi-pass. Oh, yeah, I want a multi-pass. <laughs> Most of the good swords, the white suit, the entire Acme catalog. <laughs> <laughs> really, Chuck, you want the Acme ca- None of their stuff ever works. Um, I can or easily is, uh, see Chuck getting that stuff so he could make it work. <laughs> Yeah, of course, you could argue that a lot of the problems with the Acme stuff are uh, uh, operator-involved. Chuck makes things. <laughs> uh, Kevin Kaminsky, uh, and welcome to the comments, uh, to the questions, uh, Kevin. Uh, I mean, I might know what kind of leather jacket Roy Kent wears in Ted Lasso. Yeah, that's a good choice. And his, my wife might have made the biscuits. Really? You found the recipe for those? Hmm. But also, I feel like this has happened with food, but I can't think of a specific brand. Hmm. Uh, from our gen- uh, Mike's genetically related listener, Val, uh, product placement has never worked on me. If anything, I'm turned off to the product just because it's been put in a movie. One time, it actually pissed me off. In Strictly Ballroom, the main characters have a scene dancing on the roof of the dance studio in front of a big... I don't know how to pronounce this. Paylette? P a i l l e t t, palette covered. It's a, th- I'm sure it's a thing. I just sequins. Oh, coverage Coca Cola sign. The production company actually had to pay Coke for the use of that sign. Arg. That being said, there has occasionally been a prop or set dressing that I would love to have that's never, to my knowledge, been marketed. I'd love to have one of the T-shirts the workers in Oz are wearing, the green ones that just say Oz on the front. Boy, I forgot about that. Yeah. Our international contingent, Vince. Few things take me out of a movie like product placement, and it turns me off completely from whatever they want to sell. Some products become associated with film, like maybe Bond cars are a good example of doing it in the context of the film. In your face, turning the logo toward the camera when drinking a soda just makes me groan out loud. Well, thank you all for uh, your answers. Yes. Most interesting and insightful. And uh, there will be bumpy bucks galore for all of you. Ooh, galore. Have a galore, galore. on us. <laughs> Indeed. So Max, has, uh, uh, yeah. has product placement ever done anything for you? See, that's, one of the, that's why this question is so difficult. I don't know. <laughs> one of the problems with, no, with product placement is it's supposed to work, in effect, subconsciously. You're not really supposed to be uh, aware of it. I don't think so. I don't consciously remember seeing a logo in something and going, yeah, you know what? I'm suddenly, I'm thirsty for BMW. (laughs) It's uh, it's not how it's supposed to work. I I don't think so, but I I honestly couldn't say. But what about you? I only notice it when it's beyond egregious. um, And otherwise, if it's used, 
if it's just in the background, you know, like they happen to be filming on a street and it's got, you know, something in it. Although that's never a mistake. That's always, I, it takes me out of the story. So whenever it's, you know, just there. And the worst example I can think of was Godzilla 1985. And the reason it's the uh, worst example. Yes, I see. <laughs> Is because, and I actually give them lots of credit for this, the original 19 God, uh, 1952 Godzilla film, when it was brought over to the States, they thought, well, Americans won't watch this, so we need to throw in, of all people, Raymond Burr. Well, when Americans Go- love Raymond Burr. <laughs> Well, back then they might have. Uh, in 1985, they decided to have him reprise his role <laughs> as reporter Steve Martin, a name that was no longer particularly appropriate. A wild and crazy journalist. And so for that Godzilla film alone, that only that one, they made this new footage which involved a bunch of Americans on this army base and Raymond Burr, who was still around. And there was one shot where two army guys were on the army base across the hall from each other talking. And the only reason they were across the hall was so that you could see the brightly lit Dr. Pepper machine dead center of the screen. (laughs) See, one where it sort of works and it's almost integrated into the movie is in Dr. Strangelove. Mm -hmm. Captain Mandrake is trying to get a dime for the telephone, by the way, the telephone booth, by the way. Uh, for our listeners, a telephone booth oh, was stop. a publicly ex- oh, <laughs> and they a dime was a small oh, circular stop. piece of metal. <laughs> used to cost a dime. Um, but he he doesn't have any change, so he asks, uh, "Who is it, K- Colonel Batguano? Mm-hmm. <laughs> if that really is your name, <laughs> to shoot the Coke machine?" He specifically mm-hmm. said the. And get the coins out. And again, yes, it's kind of a plug for Coke, but it leads to one of the best lines where Colonel Batguano looks at him and says, you know, if this, if you're fooling with me, you know what'll happen? What? You're going to have to answer to the Coca-Cola company. I also used to hate it during peanut specials. Because peanut specials were Uh-oh. always sponsored by Dolly Madison Dolly cakes, Madison! <laughs> which you could not get. No. <laughs> not in the in Northeast, anyway. Not, not here. I never saw one. And that's, to be fair, that's a commercial. That's that's sponsorship. That's not the same. Um, I It just takes me out of the moment a uh, lot when it's done. Now, again, Bond, I think, is a good example. Do I want an Aston Martin? Sure. Should I have yeah. an Aston Martin? No. <laughs> but I want uh, one. I just... I decided I didn't want one when I found out they didn't come with the machine guns and the rotating license plates and the ejector seat. Um, they actually do. So what? Aston Martin recently, this is way off topic, Aston Martin yeah. recently released a very limited number, I think it was 25, hand-built brand new DB5s with all of the gadgets included. I have to go sell my house now. Excuse and they me. all work. <gasps> I Wait, mean, how can they legally mount machine guns in a car? They just flash and have noise. But they actually go... I don't care, I want it! <laughs> I know, I know. Oh my god, that's so cool! All I can say is that uh, the Mach 5 is right over there. You should do that. <laughs> Buzz saws. <laughs> and, uh, of course, now we have drones, so you could do the bird, right? Yeah, you could have the homing robot. Yeah, the mountain tires might be tough, but, you know. That would be a little harder, but... Never still, mind I, the... No, uh, I, want the, I want the seal... How about the uh, windshield that seals itself... And the car can go underwater. You mean the, the windshield with no A pillars? Yeah, that's yes. going to happen. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, thanks for all the uh, cool yes. answers. You know, Appreciate even it. if it wasn't exactly what we uh, thought we'd get, that's what's half the fun of doing the uh, answers. Yep. Uh, but we're not going to tell you how to do that till the end of the show because Max oh, right not. now yes. has a new yeah, question. Me. Yes, I do. Was there ever any movie about a profession, line of work that made you go, oh man, I want to do that? Oh wow. Or conversely... I never want to do that. <laughs> and did it actually, did you end up doing that? I'm going to go with Chud. No. <laughs> <laughs> you, I don't know. You became a pretty big Chud. <laughs> uh, you, listen, you load. Uh, <laughs> uh, with that question out there now, I yep. think it's now time yep. for trivia. The show. So, oh, Masters of the Universe, 1987. <sighs> Budget, $22 million. That much, huh? <laughs> Yeah. Worldwide gross, 17 million. <laughs> yeah. Ouch. Mm. Uh, Frank Langella is on record, on record, stating that playing Skeletor was one of his favorite roles. His son was a huge fan and was running around the house all day yelling, by the power of Grayskull! <laughs> 
So he took the role for him. Wow. He also wrote some of his own lines. You know, yeah. good for you, Frank. You know, tell me about the loneliness of good, He-Man. <laughs> Is it equal to the loneliness of evil? <laughs> like, wow. Uh, as a follow-up, by the way, apparently Frank attended a private screening of the movie with his son, Alex, who fell asleep halfway through. <laughs> huh, what a coincidence. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, the throne room set of Castle of Grayskull was originally two big adjoining sound stages, two of them. They knocked down the wall between them. At that point, that was the largest set Hollywood had used in over 40 years. Pity. Oh, I mean, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Try not to give anything away, Captain Subtle. <laughs> Come on, it's Masters of the Universe. What's yeah. there to give away? A lot of people who've seen the movie comment on how eerie Meg Foster, who plays uh, Say Evil it. Lynn. <laughs> yes, that's her name. It's apparent on... Uh, Which on, side on is she on? Evelyn. <laughs> yeah, Evil Lynn. Wow. Gives her this sort of sinister and unearthly air. She's not wearing contact lenses, by the way. Ew. Those are her real eyes. She has naturally very blue-gray irises and naturally tiny pupils. Give her that weird experience, that weird appearance. Uh, she shows up in a lot of science fiction fantasy roles <laughs> purely because of her eyes, and she jokes that she appeals to casting directors because she brings her own special effects for free. See, I thought she just suffered from Kirstie Alley syndrome. <laughs> No, no, it's, it's just her. Right, Meg Foster that, syndrome. Now, well, uh, Frank Langella may have liked this. Dolph Lundgren has said that the f working on the film was a nightmare. <laughs> the shooting schedule was five months, including two months of night shooting. He said he was approached to do a sequel during, the sh during shooting and turned it down. However, in uh, during an interview for when he was on tour for The Expendables in 2010, he said he'd return to appear in a new movies, either as a cameo or as He-Man. <laughs> sure. Yeah. There, and uh, despite the um, lackluster performance, there was a script for the sequel written called Masters of the Universe 2 Cyborg. Well, now it see... Followed, hmm? Did you... I, see, I've never done this before, although I've seen this film a number of times. Did you sit through the entire credit sequence? Because I'd never done that. Me to the end, the end yeah. credit. Yes, I did. Uh, I did never there, remember there seeing. Is a se there's a sequel bag at the yes, end the where <laughs> Skeletor reappears, looks looks right into the camera, and says, "I'll be back." No, no. It's like <laughs> Skeletor leaps up out of a tank of water for no oh, particularly yeah. good reason, and dripping yep. says, "I'll be back." I'll, yeah, excuse me. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, there was. It was supposed to. It was supposed to follow He Man who returned to Earth to battle Skeletor who'd left Earth a post-apocalyptic wasteland. It was going to feature Trapjaw <laughs> and She-Ra. Uh. And uh, Albert Pyun was hired to direct, but the film did so badly, both Mattel and Canon Pictures decided to cancel production on the sequel. Aww. Pyun rewrote the script, which became the Jean-Claude Van Damme movie Cyborg. Ah, <laughs> yep. Cyborg started life as a He-Man <laughs> sequel. Okay. Yes, it did. <laughs> uh, Mattel, which, you know, owned He-Man... And the toy line mandated early in production that He-Man could not kill anyone on screen. <laughs> That's why Skeletor's troops are all robots, and He-Man, all the live characters just sort of get knocked around a little. Mm. Uh, Mattel uh, also pre uh, ran a contest where the winner would get a role in the new He-Man movie. Ah. Uh. Yeah, the production was under a lot of pressure to finish in time and under budget, so the, ga the director, Gary Goddard, Sort of had to squeeze the contest winner into the shoot. The winner was a fellow named Richard Zbonder, and he's Pig Boy, who hands Skeletor his staff when he returns from Earth, <laughs> even in the end credits. Ah. And his family is so proud. <laughs> yeah, poor Richard Zbonder. Apparently, he had a really bad reaction to the glue they used to hold his mask in place. Oh, dear. And his face got really burnt. Oh, dear. Uh, oh, dear. And a gentleman named Anthony DeLongas trained Dolph Lundgren in the use of the sword. <laughs> yeah. He should have he removed also his the, name. <laughs> yeah. He also plays Blade, oh. the guy with one eye and two ridiculously large swords. Sure. 
He choreographed the fight between He-Man and Blade and the climatic duel between He-Man and Skeletor. Oh. And by the way, if you were wondering why suddenly Frank Langella is so darn athletic in that final fight, that ain't him. That's the longest. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I know. Control your shock. Two long swords, huh? Compensating for... Any- uh, uh, go yeah, ahead, yeah. <laughs> uh, When this was filmed, Dolph Lundgren had, shall we say, limited acting experience. <laughs> Yeah, he had a bit part in a Bond movie with no speaking role, and he was, as we all remember, Ivan Drago from Rocky IV, who's mainly his line is, I must destroy you. Uh, And he had a very thick Swedish accent and was not, shall we say, fluent in English. (laughs) Uh, Originally, Godard had planned to have all his lines dubbed by another actor, but Lundgren's contract stipulated that he would get at least three opportunities to redub his lines in post-production. And the film was running behind schedule and over budget, so Godard decided to use Lundgren's natural voice. <laughs> what a brilliant directorial choice. Oh, yeah, that was a heck of a choice. <laughs> According to Godard, the draft of the script took place completely on Earth to keep the budget down, and he liked the fish-out-of-water aspect, but he asked for a little more money so he could at least start and end the film on the planet Eternia. Sure. Be- all better for it. Yes. It felt much more real, much more authentic. <laughs> yeah. Now, Canon was not doing real well at this point. At, between this and Superman 4. Didn't that also movies... have uh, Dolph Lundgren in it? Didn't he play Sun? The... No, he was. No, you're thinking of Solar Man, and that was just another large, inarticulate blonde. Oh, well, you know, they're so hard to tell apart. Yeah, yeah, you're, you were easily forgiven for having thought it was Lundgren, <laughs> but it wasn't. Uh, okay, Solar Man. Uh, they made a decision to discontinue all filming three days before the scheduled end, be- leaving the movie in a bit of a quandary. All the climatic scenes were completed, except for the final battle and resolution between He Man and Skeletor. After two months, the Canon executives let him film the ending in a complete, if rather rushed, manner, which doesn't show at all. Honestly, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, fascin- the fantastic cosmic key prop, <laughs> they, built it, they built three of them. Sure. Each one was personally constructed by Richard Edlund, the prop master. They were all very fragile and broke down a lot, so they had to have a special team on hand for all of them to repair them during filming. Uh, In a 2012 auction, they were valued at $6,000 each. That's it, huh? That's it. Oh, well. Now, there was some uh, slight controversy that no one noticed because no one cared, (laughs) uh, where John Byrne, the comic book writer, was was... pointing out some similarities between the movie and Jack Kirby's New God stories. Huh. Now, Godard clarified in a letter to John Byrne that Byrne was right, that uh, the film was an homage <laughs> to all of Kirby's Marvel work as well. Uh, Godard tried to hire Kirby as a conceptual artist and also planned to dedicate the film in the closing credits to him but the studio objected to both ideas, and I imagine Jack Kirby is very grateful for that. If I remember correctly, homage is a French word meaning to steal. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Uh, the Godard's vision of the motion picture comic book take on the film, with the studio looked at that and said, oh, please, comic books are just for kids. Yeah, and we wonder why they went out of business. Yeah. There's a surprising amount of other... Uh, s- trivia, including the fact only three action figures were ever based on this movie from the He-Man line. Well, they used almost and none of the, the action figures no. in the film. <laughs> yeah, this was supposed to generate new ones, and they just didn't bother. It was just like Wildor, Blade, and Saurad. If you remember, Saurad, who is Sauron's uh, less <laughs> successful cousin. Well, and what about Karg? Uh, I'm oh, short, yes. and I have a big head. Grr! <laughs> I guess. I just figured they picked tiles out of a Scrabble bag for him. They, they did feel very lazily named, didn't they? Blade, because he's got blades. Yeah. Stuff. And oh yeah, because of other otherwise the incredibly imaginative naming of uh, He Man characters. <laughs> hey, like don't Roboto you diss on Stinkor <laughs> or, or Moss Man or <laughs> Beast Man and Beast Man. 
And he was in there, yep. I love She-Ra because it said to me, it's like, we've got He-Man and she uh, 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 ra <laughs> Well, like, I, I just pictured, I literally pictured, yes, yeah, so we got He-Man and she Oh, God, what's the name for a female man? Um, um. <laughs> <laughs> well, the syllable ra is so descriptive. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, so that that's all I got. There's plenty more out there. And now, my favorite part, you get to do the plot. <laughs> you picked it. Yep. On the planet Eternia, <laughs> home of Castle Grayskull. <laughs> yeah, I just love starting off a, a, a plot summary that way. Yeah. Holder, uh, Castle Grayskull, holder of the awesome, poorly defined power, the evil Skeletor, and we know he's evil because he tells us, and because one of his minions actually has the word evil as part of her name, has defeated the sorceress. We assume she can do magic because of her name, although we never see her do anything. Anything at all. She just stands there, literally just stands there the whole movie. Does she, get, she gets older. Yeah, she... Uh, who has the well-defined and well-oiled pecs to stop Skeletor? <laughs> Why, it's He-Man and his amazing friends. <laughs> they rescue a bad Yoda ripoff named Gwildor, who transports them to the primitive and tacky planet Earth, because that's something they do. <laughs> they bring with them the cosmic MacGuffin, which Skeletor desperately wants, because otherwise we aren't going to have any picture. <laughs> The Eternians run into a bunch of really annoying Earthlings, including a future member of Friends, a point with a pointlessly tragic backstory, a future Star Trek officer, and Mr. Strickland from Back to the Future. <laughs> slacker. Poor, I, poor, I kept waiting for him to call everybody a slacker. <laughs> Poorly choreographed battles are fought, cheesy dialogue is delivered, and He-Man ends up in the fetish scene we always knew he wanted. <sighs> Good guys win. Naughtiness is defeated. How? Why? Stop asking so many questions and enjoy, enjoy Dolph Lundgren's six-pack. Hello down. I know I did. <laughs> there. Happy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> let's uh, let's start with the acting, uh, shall we? <laughs> uh, yeah, that won't take long. Uh, well, okay. Dolph Lundgren is oh not dear. a master thespian. <laughs> Um, She's not a mistress thespian either. He's no. I'm not sure that community theater really wants him either. Now, he may have got... I never saw the Expendables. Maybe he got better in the Expendables. Um, I... He got less bad as he went along. I mean, even in the... <laughs> what is it? Universal <laughs> Soldier. At least he looks like he's having a good time within that one with Jean-Claude Van Damme. He's very large. He's very well put together. And before I came out, he made me feel funny. Uh, <laughs> yes, that was a fetish scene. Let's yeah. rope He-Man in his leather underwear and whip him. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And, and they strip him down to just his leather speedo and boots and yeah. uh, chain him up, and forcing him for some reason <laughs> to hold his arms in a bodybuilder pose. Well, I love the fact he's, he's sort of roped to the sides, but he yeah. could just sort of squat down and it wouldn't be a problem, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, my favorite part is they whip him at one point and he sort of turns and looks like he's trying to deflect the whip with his butt cheek. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and his reactions are pretty, uh, Yeah. Uh, well, uh. uh and <laughs> at least, though, he uh. really sells the sword fighting. No, he doesn't. <laughs> no, he really like, doesn't. The, the sword, the fight choreography is just so dopey. My my line was dullest sword fight ever, and it really is boring. I mean, it's it honestly makes the original fight between Obi Wan Kenobi and Darth Vader look kind of like, <laughs> I don't know, an, a cage match at, at uh, WWF. Um, <laughs> it just at, who cares? <laughs> I do have to say, Frank Langella, he is having, having such a good time. He is so much fun to watch because he is just. Going for it. He is clearly enjoying himself so much, and he's so into it, and his makeup is so terrible. Every, <laughs> I love I don't that know, Skeletor has lips. <laughs> yeah, Skeletor has lips, but no nose, except you can see the black fabric covering the nose holes. I don't know why they kept doing close-ups, except, you know, you have Frank Langella. Of course you're going to do a close-up. Well, you can't tell who it is. No, well, you can by the voice. No, yeah. Yeah. And, oh, Lord, it's like the, no piece of scenery goes unchewed. Well, and here's the thing. It still ends up not being, in a, in a way, I didn't think it was a cheesy performance. You know, he no. wasn't, 
when sometimes when you see people really just like you're saying eating the scenery and and you know pooping it out in front of you he's <laughs> Totally serious, and that, to me, shows what a really good actor and, and underused actor, quite honestly, Frank is. Yeah. Because I, I'd never laughed at Skeletor. I was sitting there just in awe of the fact that he could take it this seriously and not go nuts. He did. A, I must possess all, <laughs> or I possess nothing. <laughs> and he pulls it off. He does. He does. I mean, he's got a terrible mask. His outfit is nothing to write home about. There's literally no motivation except I want everything, which, okay, yeah. sure. Um, there was no, and I mean, all we do is we see, we basically start the movie after he's taken over Eternia. And we know this because they tell us we don't see yeah. anything. <laughs> no, and apparently Eternia is populated by about 35 people. <laughs> well, one of my lines for that was so much cheaper when you just refer to the people instead of actually yeah. showing them. Yeah. And they actually, one point, do say that. It's like, oh, the people will revolt. It's like, what what people? But, They're yeah, all right I didn't here. see anybody, yeah. <laughs> They're all here. Um, uh, Robert Patrick Smith Jones, three names, whatever his <laughs> name is. Um, yeah, Robert Duncan McNeil. That's here. right, a.k.a. from Voyager, Lieutenant Tom Paris. I think he does fine. Honestly, I, for a very thankless role, he's trying to sell it role. the best he's, he can, too. He's uh, the teenage boyfriend, yep. Yeah, and he's fine. Courtney Cox is Courtney Cox. She has a yeah, terrible she, role. She Oh, God, the dialogue she has to say, the whole part is awful. All I can think is like, you know, she probably had more fun dancing with Bruce Springsteen in the Dancing in the Dark video. Right, where we didn't know who she was, or we thought yeah. we didn't know who she was, or we weren't supposed to know, or whatever. Um, no, no, that was her first time on any screen. Well, This was she, her first big-budget movie, by the way. Well, at least she has friends. Um <laughs> Billy Barty, be for her. who I'm going to give points because somehow in his contract he gets top billing. <laughs> it's impressive. He's the first name on, in the credits. Um, By the way, the op speaking of the opening credits, did that music sound at all like the Superman theme to you? Well, I, again, one of my notes, music is not quite Superman, not quite Star Wars, not quite Indy Jones, not quite Cinderella. But you won't be buying and it anyway. nothing, by the way, nothing at all like the cartoon's theme song. No, no. Or but theme music. I we'll, can't, don't think it really has a song. We'll, we'll get to the comparison with that, too. Yeah. Uh, Billy Barty's Billy Barty. He's yeah. been in tons of things. He is probably the most famous little person actor there probably ever was next to um, uh, Warwick Davis. Oh, Michael, yep, or and maybe Michael Dunn a little Michael bit. Michael Dunn. Um, I'm sorry, who was the guy in Time Bandits? Uh, oh, David Rappaport. David Rappaport. Uh, but, I mean, Billy Barty has been making things forever. Um, and he throws himself into it, too. It's a yep. terrible part. The mask is the worst in the Ugh. film. Um, and, and he, he is just... <laughs> it runs on neutrinos! Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he has terrible dialogue, and he is just... He is there to be just such forced comic relief. Yeah. But he he gives it his all. He, Billy Barty never holds back. Nope. I, he's not the most talented. No. But he is absolutely, he delivers. And here's he, the you, thing. You, they don't actually ever make fun of his height, which I think is like a very small bit of praise I will give this yeah. film. Um, yeah, they make fun of everything else because he like, he, basically every scene is, oh, Gwildor. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah. He was uh, basically a replacement for the character from the cartoon, Orko, who was right. there for the comic relief. Simply because Orko never walks, he floats around all the time, and that was just too expensive. Yeah, but whatever. Um, I, I don't know who the guy who played a man at arms, but at one point he gave me serious Will Ferrell vibes. <laughs> and oh. honestly, I would probably pay $8 again or whatever to see Will Ferrell play man at arms. Because <laughs> I just play think man that, at arms. He just starts oh, playing with sure. cat toys or something. That's a deeper. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So strangely, and, and the guy playing Strickland, I don't know him from anything else but Back to the Future. Maybe that's all he does, but he brings his Mr. Strickland to the game and he plays his cards, you know? Yeah, he's an incredible, he plays the guy as a huge jerk and he does it fine. Yeah. But yeah, again, a lot of energy. I, I, by the way, that's, uh, yeah, he's uh, James Tolkien. Sure. Is, uh, is uh, Strickland. <laughs> I, so strangely, the acting is not something I'm going to point fingers at in this no. film. It is I, uh, the woman playing Eva Lynn, uh, uh, Meg Ryan. Yeah, is fine. She, she tries. She but has again, literally she's got nothing, nothing to do, do. now. And th the woman playing Tila is there. 
Well, we I get mean, what is it? A halfway through the film before we find out what her name is and who she's related to. Oh yeah, this is my dad. Oh no, I'm uh, Duncan, and this is my daughter Teeler. Like that's the only yeah. reason I know who she is. Is she a love interest of He Man? We don't know. We don't know anything about her. Nope. We do know one thing. She has the amazing power and the only one in the movie to break the fourth wall. Because there is one brief moment in the fight in the music store <laughs> where she bursts into the room, shoots a bunch of people, and turns and looks right at the camera and says, Woman at arms. Yeah. For no reason. And it right. doesn't... Uh. So I don't I mean, know if this actress is any good. She might be. Yeah. But we don't know. There's no way to tell. I we gotta say, another point in this film's favor, nobody ever says anything like you shoot well for a woman. Or, they never yeah. actually denigrate her for her position and, or being a woman. Nothing. Which good. That's the way it should be. I don't want anybody to take any other lessons from this film. <laughs> Not to give anything <laughs> away. Wink. Yeah. But um I you know, that's the way women should be they should just play their roles and it should never be oh you're a good shot for a, you're a good card player for a while no no yeah, you're there's a good never card any player sense period like that she, she's also not there just to be rescued no no she's just as capable as duncan <laughs> a name that just exudes skill and manliness That's right. i'm duncan i'm here for the donuts yeah, yeah you know there you go um the script though oh boy um, talk about tin ear. Um, the, the, the use of language is just embarrassing. The abuse of language. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's not all really horrible. It's just you, the person who wrote the dialogue doesn't know how people talk. That's all. Yeah. <laughs> Especially <laughs> Del Skeletor. <laughs> uh, uh, although now knowing that Frank wrote some of his lines, I just am actually more impressed with Mr. Langella. Um, cause I've seen him literally, I think in three things I've seen him in Dracula, I've seen yep. him in this and I've yep. seen him in the ninth gate. And so I'm in Dave. I didn't see Dave, but, uh, I think he's, I think he was in a really good movie. Uh, I think wasn't he the one who played an elderly patient who gets a robot? I think he did. Yes. Oh, uh, which apparently he was very I, good in. Yep. Um, yep. They were, they were, you got Oscar buzz for that one. I think he's underused, but, uh, the, the script it's sort of joyless. And I have a question for you, Max. Um, yeah. Is this for kids? Uh. Because I'm not sure. I guess because there's lots of goofy Ninja Turtle costumes and. Well, except that nothing's the violence brightly colored. Is very car- yeah, but the violence is, isn't uh, particularly bloody. There's no, actually, there's almost no blood. Uh, you know, He-Man doesn't kill anybody. There's no bad language. A lot of property is destroyed, which kids well, like. I think Strickland does actually say the S word once. Oh, no, that's true. Or whatever true. his name is. In the, he's Strickland. I it's, it, literally, it's... I swear it's the same costume. But Yeah, same costume, same personality. Yeah. Except he's a cop instead of a whatever principal or assistant principal or whatever he was in uh, Back to the Future. But in the credits, it doesn't mention the cartoon show. It says, based no. on the toys by Mattel. So there's no brightly colored costumes. Yeah. Although quite honestly, in believe it or not, in the toys, He Man's even more fetish than he's in this because he's got a big <laughs> harness um, and furry underwear. Um, but <laughs> I mean, I assume it's fur. That's what the texture looks like. Not that I've yeah. ever owned one too. Um, <laughs> but I. Wasn't sure who the film was for because it's if it's based on toys and you'd think, well, we want to sell toys, so let's make this thing for kids. But it's all it takes place at night, so it's physically dark. Um, there's all this shit. Where did He Man get a gun? He Man doesn't have a gun. Yeah, the whole point yeah, of the show got is guns he's, in this. Yeah. He's got the sort of power which he eventually uses, kinda. Um, kinda. Although he doesn't That's... get a sparkly new outfit like. Uh, like Skeletor did. Skeletor's outfit, which looks like what? Did, what did I have in my notes? Because that outfit is just insane. I think the and proper it, word uh, is it's fabulous. <laughs> it is very <laughs> fabulous. It looks like uh, Art Deco disco Inca stuff. Yeah, he actually looks and uncomfortable don't even, in it. <laughs> and we're an hour thirty four minutes in before we actually hear the "I have the power" line, and they, and they didn't dub him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they didn't dub him. That's the other thing. We There's no... 
He Man is the is the identity secret identity of Prince Adam. I can't believe you just told people that. It's oh, I'm sorry. To be Spoiler a alert. <laughs> I, I was yeah, I was going to get to that when we got to our questions, but yeah, yeah. like the sword seems to have no. It's not even like there's one point where he throws it at one of the yeah. robot got guy, robot guys. We see yeah. a mouth. We know it's not a yeah. robot. Yeah. Um, and I was like, He Man would never throw the sword because that's the sword of power. I kept thinking sword of omens. <laughs> <laughs> Give me sight beyond sight. sight. Beyond sight, yes. Yeah. I wasn't my when I was a kid, but I still know it. Um, I, I just I don't know. I I mean, it was 19, what eighty six? I think it was. Um, it was still you know playing off Star Wars. Yeah. And oh another, yeah, there's a lot. Boy, the Star Wars Wars influence is really strong in this one. Yeah, but it's like I couldn't. I couldn't understand why it wasn't for kids. It's like suddenly literally doing an R-rated Barbie movie. Like, why would you do that? Like, you can't... You, the people who are seeing this are not going to buy toys. Are you just trying to appeal to the parents? But it's like there's literally no... Well, we'll get to that in other questions. Um, and also, He-Man, not particularly heroic. He's just... Not like, really. He's just <laughs> he's, a thug, basically. And he's no better than the other two. Who oh. take a lot of time not shooting things. Um, maybe they're all like stormtroopers. I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, so maybe we should get to our questions. Okay. <laughs> oh, 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 you have, you have something first? No, th there is something, uh, I, just in terms of the plot, there is an entire <laughs> subplot around Courtney Cox's character, Julie, who has oh, a yeah. tragic backstory that her parents died in a plane crash. By the way, this is all just, we're told all this. This is just nothing but exposition. Her father was a pilot and they were flying a private plane, and she blames herself because she made them... I don't remember. Who cares? Yeah. Well, she did, She did. they wanted to go to the beach. She didn't want to go to the beach. They said, well, instead we're going to fly to Catalina, which I'm not even sure you can do, but okay. Yeah. And they crashed, and she's been blaming herself for... It's not really... I don't remember how long, maybe what? a year, because according to the trivia, the uh, this movie takes place in 1986 and 1987. Oh, Good. <laughs> yeah, and uh, again, spoiler at the end, Wildor and his cosmic key, which can jump through dimensions, also, it turns out, can move through time. Sure. And he sends her back to before her parents died, and she steals the keys to the plane so they can't fly, so apparently, A, time travel exists, B, you can't alter the future, this is all thrown in in like two and a half minutes. So uh, I have a question for you. Then couldn't yeah. they have gone back and prevented this film from ever happening? <laughs> apparently, yeah. Apparently, there are some disasters you cannot. Uh, yeah, and the best part avoid. is the two characters, Julie and Kevin. Kevin, yeah, know everything that's happened, which of course haven't hasn't happened yet. And now, will it not happen? Because mm. uh, has it happened? Uh, uh, and they, that's just it's a total throwaway. It's just we want to give it a happier ending. Sure, because. We don't care about Eternia. No. We don't care what's happening there. These guys are the ones we're supposed to identify with. But anyway, yeah, yeah let's get to the questions. Eternia and it's five people. <laughs> I just picture that guy in the dungeon from uh, Holy Grail going... <laughs> <laughs> like, that's it for Eternia. It's that old guy hanging in yeah, a dungeon. Yeah. All right, questions. So let's get to our questions. Yeah. Does this... <laughs> Does this movie <laughs> capture <laughs> capture the feeling of its sort? <laughs> you can't even get through it, can no. you? Does this movie capture the feeling of its source material? No, <laughs> not at all. Good God, I, I I I can't even say. Well, the names are the same because most of them aren't. No, there's like five characters in this who are actually from the show and the toy line, and a whole bunch that just aren't. Yeah. And it just... <laughs> no, they change... Everything is messed around. Nothing is explained, which is... It, it, you would understand that if they were more faithful to the show. It's like, all right, we're going to assume everyone has either watched the show or played with the toys and knows the, the plot and knows the characters, but uh, we're not going to make them anything like that. There's no Prince Adam. There's no, no Battle Cat or Cringer. Uh... There's nothing. And uh, He-Man is no different when he has the sword and when he doesn't have the sword. Well, and even better, they're not even faithful to a small lump of plastic. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> Never it's, mind the show. It's like, see this hunk of plastic, this hunk of plastic, and Dolph Lundgren look nothing alike. Well, it's okay. I mean, you, you're you never going to find someone who looks exactly like no, He-Man I mean, like, because he it's biologically same... impossible. <laughs> he doesn't have the same costume. Yeah, it's that's like... true. He doesn't wear the same outfit. The sword looks different. The I mean... attitude is different. I mean, He-Man is supposed to be this absolute, this hero, this paragon of virtue. And, and always capable. Worrying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and actually, <laughs> well, kind of. I got to say, I never understood. He-Man has a sword in the cartoon and the toy. He never, he never stabs anybody. No. He uses it to knock over buildings or deflect things. He never stabs anyone. Why not be like the mace of Eternia or the club or something? I don't know. Oh, there's even, like, early in the film, he's deflecting the energy bolts, which thankfully yeah. are color-coded so we know who's shooting from where because the blue yeah. is the good guys and the red is the bad guys because, sure. Yep, yep. Um, and he's ref- deflecting bolts with the sword once, and then he never does it again. The sword yeah, just sits on it. his back while he shoots things. It's like well, eventually when he loses his gun, he uses it to stab somebody, sure. one of the robots. <laughs> That's about so, it. No, it does not capture. Like, and there's nothing. There's one thing that I could say. Okay, maybe if you squint real hard, you could make this into a playset. But there's nothing even designed that makes you go, "Oh, I want a toy of this." Like, yeah. dudes, the whole point of this is to sell toys, <laughs> and you couldn't even do that. The other so, thing with He Man is supposed to be insanely strong. He never does anything. He, never he doesn't anybody. do anything insanely strong. He never picks up anything incredibly heavy. He never like crashes through a wall. He's just a guy. He's just he, he's Dolph Lundgren. That's about it. Yeah. Who picks up Julie when she's wounded? Kevin, the great hero, Kevin. Yeah. Yeah. So eh. does this movie <laughs> does this movie respect its source material? Not even a little. No. I mean, there's, there's nothing. No. Nothing. I, <laughs> they don't even give Skeletor a silly voice. In the, Show, He-Man! <laughs> exactly. In the cartoon, it's impossible to be afraid of Skeletor with that voice. <laughs> I assume, Which I assume they did on purpose, because skeletons are scary. Sure. Especially when they're built like that, huh? That, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, never oh, explains why. It's the same body with a different head, I get it. <laughs> it's uh, finally caught that, okay. <laughs> yeah, you know, no, I knew that, but... Uh, no, it doesn't. Like, again, here's this plastic toy. It does this. Your movie doesn't do this. <laughs> no. You obviously don't care. Let's, let's introduce Kevin, I guess. I mean, there's Man-at-Arms. He's there, and Man-at-Arms' yeah. name is Duncan. And yeah. Tila's name is Tila. Tila yeah. She doesn't look like that. That's not what she does. Okay. No. Uh, he's named He-Man, but doesn't turn into Prince Adam. No uh, one ever seems... That doesn't seem to bother anyone, even on Earth. Hi, this is my friend He-Man. Really? <laughs> He-Man? No one gotta, calls him Mr. Man, or can I call you He? <laughs> Mr. He. I gotta give the cast credit, and nobody laughs. We nobody don't see- giggles, and they say his name a lot. <laughs> yep. And our last question, uh, does this movie take advantage of the fact that it's a movie and not just an episode? No. Again, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, this has picked up the hat trick. It's like, oh, no, no, because this doesn't feel large scale. Any lar- I mean, the cartoon was large scale. Yeah. You had, you know, okay, we see Skeletor's throne room. That's supposed to be, so- or sorry, Castle Grayskull. That's supposed to be impressive. Made with styrofoam. You got the same thing in the cartoon, and honestly, just as looked about the... I think it looked better in the cartoon. I have a cosmic key. We shall travel to Burbank. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the far off flung reaches of Burbank. It's, I think yeah. it's one of, the, one of Ming's lesser uh, areas there. In, yeah, yeah. In, in, so, uh, I, I don't think so. No, there was no, no. sense of uh, impressive scale. There, it all took place in either... One big room, or this little town, <laughs> or a music store, yeah, or, or a music store. Yeah, they, they took Ugh. a lot of time in that music store. They really um, did. Yeah. So, um, not so, uh, not so much. Do you have any other notes uh, that you wanted to? Oh, I had a lot of notes, but most of them are just like arg. I, <laughs> I, I had a question from early on. There, they yeah. uh, R- Courtney Cox is running away from the evil bad evil. <laughs> Evil Lynn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At least in the car- newest cartoon, they just call her Lynn at one point. Can we just yeah. call you Lynn? Is that all right? Yes, it's fine. Okay. So they're running through a, a junkyard, and there's this bright neon sign with an arrow pointing off to the side that says, Pizza. <laughs> <laughs> 
I, 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 I suddenly you were hungry for pizza. Well, it wasn't even product. It wasn't any pizza. It, it, you know, it was just pizza. It's like, do you? I don't, <laughs> don't go to junkyards often, but do you often serve pizza there? Is that a thing? You know, let's spend the day and oh, well, I'm going to get hungry. I might as well have some junkyard pizza. I guess. Now, admitted, I will say. <laughs> A lot of the characters in this in this movie do the same stupid things that people did in the old cartoon. Okay. Like, you know, when Karg is leading the elite warriors. Karg! After, is, after, after Julie, what's his big thing? Find her! Yeah, nice one, Sun Tzu. <laughs> Good, great, great generalship there. And uh, Saurad, one of the <laughs> finest warriors... Gets beaten up by Monica from Friends at one point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I like that the film sad. opens with such a lovely painting. Ah, uh, scenery. <laughs> <laughs> it's really one of the worst matte paintings I've seen in a long time. And it just... And there's actually other series of uh, matte paintings that... I mean, there's brushstrokes. Just, you know, <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, also, right after the credits, for absolutely no reason at all, with no source for it, just as we're leaving the credits, there's an explosion. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing. Just, it, boom. Just, boom! Eternia. Yeah. I, 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 I like, I'm sure that was like either Mr. Golan or Mr. Globus's I, idea, and they forced it on the people editing. No, there must, it's like, it's, there must be, there must be an atomic explosion and an octopus and <laughs> something scaring all the buffalo. Um, <laughs> another deeper, but there's yeah. just this, expl and nothing explodes. It's literally just the explosion with no source. Yeah. And yeah. then we're on Eternia and there's the five people. <laughs> So, yeah, but uh, I guess uh, people are dying to know. We should probably get to the... Uh, yeah, because this is pretty... Uh, yeah. this, this is, we've been pretty subtle about our opinions on this, but it might have leaked in a little bit. The Roundup. So, Max. Yeah? I gotta ask you, did you see it when it came out? I don't think so, because I'm pretty sure I saw it on VHS. Ah, one point for Max. Yeah, I didn't. Did you? Yes. <laughs> Oh, wow. You saw this in the theater? Yes. Oh, dear. <laughs> How'd you like it then? <laughs> <laughs> well, as I said, I hadn't come out yet. Yeah. And so He-Man made me feel funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was, I actually enjoyed it in that it was delightfully terrible. Um, you know, it was fun to make fun of at the time. And I think I actually saw it in one of Boston's biggest screens. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. You didn't want to miss those fabulous effects. Yeah. So, this is 10 years after Star Wars, mind you. Yeah. And they didn't use their time well. <laughs> no. Uh, it's awful. And the thing is, is, it's actually an action film, I guess. And there's all this it action. Is. And it's actually pretty dull. <laughs> it's like, it's, there's yeah. never a sense of danger. I mean, you'd have to care about anybody first. And again, I got to give the actors credit. They're doing their best, mostly, Dolph. Um, and you just don't care. It's like, oh, Julie's in trouble. Mm. <laughs> okay. When Julie's in trouble, I am not slow. It's hip, 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 and away I go. Yeah. Hey, they're beating up on Kevin. Eh. <laughs> Good. <laughs> oh, no, they shot He-Man in the arm. Uh, but the he man's been captured. Oh. I mean, it's, it's a lot of fighting and a lot of, eh. <laughs> and they're trying so hard to make you care about the char about some of the characters. They try to give Julie her tragic backstory. They yeah. they try to make it seem like there's this big bond of friendship. At the end, they're trying to give him a whole Wizard of Oz goodbye sequence, and all I can think is, I'll miss you most of all, steroid eating scarecrow. <laughs> Well, the original cartoon is incredibly goofy because He-Man oh, yeah. showed up at the height of Action for Children's Television, which was this group of concerned parents who used uh, to take all, basically suck all the fun out of cartoons. Let's put it that way. So Speed yeah, Racer oh, was banned for years because, oh, yeah. it's too violent, you know, whatever. Uh, and Tunes. every cartoon had to have, like, moral lessons. And, yeah. You know. And the only thing, good thing to come out of action for children's television was all of the G.I. Joe memes <laughs> where <laughs> yep. it's, you know, knowing is half the battle. <laughs> uh, pork chop sandwiches. Um, that's literally the only good thing. And He-Man was made 
after they'd shown up. So there's like, well, here's the criteria. It was basically the comics code for cartoons for kids. Yeah. So yeah. like, yeah, nobody actually gets attacked. He's got a sword. But nobody some dies. Great, great memes came out of the He-Man show, yeah. most of which, as you've pointed out, were kind of um, gay in <laughs> <laughs> uh, and let's face it, here is this big honking muscular guy in his underpants holding his sword out in front of his crotch all the time. And yeah. what are you supposed to think? Um, and this this film has not even the goofy joy that they had. I mean, and, the, you know, we're talking like two frames a second. Yeah. It's yes. just missing from this film. So. No, uh, I, I I enjoyed it making fun of it when I first saw it. Now it's just it's actually kind of boring. Even the parts that are funny, I actually had to remind myself with twenty minutes to go. Oh yes, you should be making fun of this because it was that dull. Um, so when you saw it on VHS, yeah. why did you see it? <laughs> I don't remember. I think because I was curious. I, uh, I had watched some of the cartoon, not uh -huh. a lot, but uh, I never owned any of the toys. I think that oh. was after my time. Hmm. But uh, it was a, there, were, there weren't a whole lot of fantasy movies. There, there were some coming out, but not a lot of them made it to videotape yet. I don't and, think that's uh, a good enough excuse. <laughs> yeah, I, and I thought it was funny. I yeah. enjoyed it. I thought it was just one of those so bad it's hilarious movies. And I thought that again the second time, because I saw it again a few years later. I still thought, yeah, this is hilarious. And it now? does the. It's not as funny. It's it is so dull. It's so slow. Some of it is still really funny, and the questions it raises are really something. Because the plot holes in this, and just the ideas, and I have all these notes about what's this? Julie sleeps in her grandmother's nightgown, or you know, <laughs> after Julie comes down and steals the paper and her dad's keys. I'm like, and then they had her committed. <laughs> <laughs> well, and she, her parents died, and she's in high school, and she lives alone, huh? Yeah, apparently, but, yeah. Uh, sure. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's a yeah. Thing. And Lu you know, Detective Lubick, he's you know the the slacker. <laughs> It, he ends up go, live. He decides I'm going to live here in Eternia after not believing the whole thing, the whole movie. I'm going to live in Castle Grayskull and look, they gave me a woman <laughs> and a castle. Yeah, they, it's like, hi, who is this woman? Did they, is this a slave? Is this some? <laughs> have you been forcibly married? What the hell? My name is Prince Lubick. I own a mansion and a whore. <laughs> 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 yeah, whatever. And sure. he's like, hey, wow, look, there's another person in Eternia. And she doesn't get any lines. <laughs> Our population is doubled. <laughs> they gave her a little bit as a present. Yeah, sure. Hey. Yeah, I, I, except for the name, you could easily have named him something else. And this movie yeah. could have been not about He-Man at all. Yeah, like, absolutely. You could have called this, you know, I don't know, He-Bob or <laughs> Billy Bob or <laughs> Flexor. <laughs> Stretch Big Armstrong. Guy. I don't know. <laughs> That's what this is. This but, feel. This film feels like one of those off-brand knockoffs you'd uh, find. It's like, yeah. oh, I can't find this action figure. Oh, look, I found it in this dollar store. You know, it's not He-Man. Man it's, guy. Yeah, <laughs> that's what this film's like. It's a cheap you know, foreign knockoff of somebody who's never actually seen the show. Just some pictures in Famous Monsters of Filmland or something. So yeah. But, um, hey, would you do us a favor? Would you uh, recap your nifty new poll question and how people can answer it? Because they want to no, know. No, if you weren't pl paying attention, I'm not going to tell you. Yes, you are. <laughs> All right. Yes, the the uh, poll question for this week is, was there ever an, any movie about a profession that made you go, oh, man, I want to do that? Or, conversely, I never want to do that. And did you? <laughs> did you end up doing that? And you can, of course, answer this. Uh, by going to our website, maxmikemovies.com, and leaving a comment. You can email us at for extra bumpy bucks Ooh. at us at maxmikemovies.com. You can also find us on the social mediations, uh, Facebook and Twitter. Uh, you can, Maybe you're one of our seven followers. Of course, as always, you can find us through the various podcast apps, although not necessarily the poll question there. Yeah. Hey, I'm going to say right now, you can get 10 times Bumpy Bucks if you follow us on Twitter and send us a comment there. 10 times. Yeah, how yeah, can you say no to that? Yeah. That's way more than five times. It is. Yes. Much, so, much more. But, but Mike, as we close out, I made, for TV, I made from TV Love You. Yeah. What's, uh, what's our last movie going to be? 
Well, I had to think long and hard, and sadly, I couldn't find a copy of Josie and Pussycats in Outer Space. But oh, man. <laughs> I actually loved that cartoon <laughs> for no good reason at all. Absolutely no, no good reason. You, you had, no, there would be no good reason. But yes. Now, you might think I'd pick a spy movie because I think all of my choices have yeah. been spy-based, uh, but I'm not. I'm yeah. actually going to pick a TV show that um, kind of thematically brought back a TV show that most people had utterly forgotten, as popular as it was in its day. Um, it also kind of helped boost not a sagging career, but a up-and-coming career. If I remember correctly, uh, Tommy Lee Jones wasn't quite the household name until this film came out, and suddenly he was kind of the big deal. Um, and that is, of course, 1980-somethings, I don't remember, The Fugitive, starring Harrison Ford as Harrison Ford and Tommy Lee Jones as not Harrison Ford. <laughs> and who plays David Jansen? Um, I think you do. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll have to start smoking more heavily. But we need to find out who is the one-armed man and how did he kill Dr. Richard Kimball's wife. Wait, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And can they wrap this up in one film, or is it a series of films that's still going on to this day? I bet you don't know. But you will after next week. This has been a co-production of The Voice of Max and The Movie Wrench. 